Let's summarize everything we learned about bending on this one page right here. So I have a beam of length L where I'm applying a moment to the ends. The beam in the cross-sectional area has a width B and height H. And in this case, the stress distribution inside this beam is given by MY over I, where I is the moment of inertia of the rectangular cross-section given by the formula 1 12th BH cubed. When I slice the beam in half, I have a linear stress distribution. Uh, it's zero in the center, maximum tensile stress here at the top, maximum compressive stress at the bottom. And when I slice the beam in half, I always have to have equal and opposite forces on the two pieces that I imagine I've sliced. And again, this is just describing the case where I take my beam and I'm applying it a moment in this direction. And since the top surface stretches, it's in tension. Since the bottom is uh, being smushed, it's in compression. Of course, this all reverses if I reverse the sign of the moment, but that's basically the same problem. An interesting question to ask is what's the maximum tensile st stress in the beam, which we can easily find by substituting uh, this location at h over 2 into our formula, and we get that the maximum stress depends very strongly on the height of the beam as a square power, meaning if we half the thickness, the maximum stress goes up by 4. And this ought to be intuitive that a thinner beam is going to have higher stresses in bending if we just consider a simple rectangular beam and we feel the rigidity when we bend it in this direction versus when we bend it in this direction. So it's much easier to bend the beam in the thin direction. This is a lot stiffer. When I bend it this way for the same amount of moment, I get much more deflection. So this strong dependence on the height ought to make intuitive sense to you. Let's analyze what happens now when we have the same beam, but now we have a different cross-sectional shape. So imagine we have some sort of T-like shape instead of the rectangle that we had previously. How does this change our problem? So if we try to copy what we did previously and we set Y equals to zero along the center of the beam, we, we start to see the problem that we might have, right? Because now this stress distribution, which goes from tensile, tension on the top, compression on the bottom, right? if, if we just kind of think about it, the force exerted here on the top is actually going to be distributed over a larger area. So it's going to actually have a greater force pushing on the top than pulling on the bottom. And therefore, when we, do, when we sum the forces, when we slice this beam, we might have a problem. And now if we go back and we look at the analysis we did, uh, we assumed uh, when we had the square beam from observation that the center line was special. It was the place of no deformation. But if we have a non non-symmetric cross-section, it's not the center line, but the centroid of the area. So if you go back to our first lecture on this, you recall that when we did some of the forces equaling to zero, when we sliced our beam, it had us computing an integral like this, right? Where, where we just assumed that y was at the center and it summed as, and it integrated to zero due to symmetry. But now we don't have symmetry, right? We have more area on the top than the bottom. And so we have to find the point where this integral is equal to zero. And so this is what we would call the centroid of the area. And intuitively, the way we would think about it is it's the point where we, we can perfectly balance this thing in the y direction. So here I have a little simple model. So I have my T shape. This line right here is where the center of this area is. But the centroid is around where I've put these pins. And I can see the area, I can see that that's the centroid because that's the point where I can easily balance this thing on these two pins. Now if I take the pins and I move them down to where this line is, and I hold it, then it really just wants to tilt that way. So the centroid is a special place, and the centroid is where we always will find our neutral axis. now if we sketch that stress distribution, we find that the neutral axis shifts up, therefore the maximum tensile stress is reduced, the maximum compressive stress goes up. So now even though it looks like from this perspective that there's more force in this direction than this direction, we have to remember that this force here is multiplied by all this area here, where this higher force is multiplied by a much smaller area. So kind of conceptually, this is what's happening. Where we have more area, that moves the neutral axis up to the centroid of our cross-sectional area. And that means that this stress distribution that we sketched here uh, can't be correct. The correct answer looks much closer to this one. 
So now let's consider a shape that you've probably seen at a construction site, the I-beam. So we often see beams with cross-sectional shapes that look like this. Now in this case, we would expect that the neutral axis or the centroid would be right along the center uh, due to symmetry. And we can see this in fact with our little model because if I take a model and I put my pins right in the center point, it easily balances. So in this case, the neutral axis is fixed in the center, but the difference between this and the rectangular cross section is the moment of inertia. Now, if you recall, the moment of inertia was computed by computing this integral y squared dA, and that's what we define as the moment of inertia. So we saw what the formula was for a rectangular cross section, but what is it for a shape like this? Well, so in this case, it actually is quite easy to compute this, and we can do it without even computing an integral. So let's consider a cross-sectional shape that has the same width and same height as our I-beam. And I'm gonna call this area one. So moment of inertia one in this case is nothing more than 1 12th bh cubed. Now let's look at the areas uh, that we would want to cancel out, which are these empty spaces here. So that area we'll call A2 in this case, I2 of this moment of inertia about its neutral axis, which again is right here in the center. So the neutral axis in this case is right down the middle. I2 in this case is nothing more than B1 H1 cubed, where in this case, That's H1 and that's B1. So to compute the total moment of inertia of our I-beam, it's nothing more than I1 minus two times I2. Simple as that. So now let's think about why the I-beam is such an efficient structure. So here we have our I-beam, the neutral axis here, Y equals to zero is right here along the center line. And our formula for computing the moment of inertia is to compute the integral y squared dA. So we can see here that what we're doing is we're taking the integral of the distance from the neutral axis and we're integrating it over the entire cross section of the I-beam structure. So in the I-beam structure, we have a lot of area out here that's a large distance from the neutral axis, so it makes this integral get larger and larger and larger. So it has a high moment of inertia by concentrating the area far away from the neutral axis. And if you recall, the maximum stress in bending is given by our formula m, which is the moment, y, which is the distance to the neutral axis, divided by our moment of inertia. So the higher the moment of inertia, the lower the stress. So let's compare our I-beam to a slightly different structure that has the same area. So now we've taken these two pieces of the I-beam and we've moved them in towards the center. So now when I compute the moment of inertia, or I compute the integral y squared dA, where we're integrating now over this area, we can see that this structure is gonna have a much smaller moment of inertia because now we have lots of area, dA, a very close distance to the neutral axis so where y isn't very large. And so even though these two uh, cross sections can have the same area, this one will have a much larger moment of inertia than this one due to the large concentration of area a large distance from the neutral axis. To be a little more quantitative, let's compare the following two cross-sectional shapes. A square that's five by five centimeters and an I-beam that's also five by five centimeters but has a geometry as such. So in this case, the area of the beam is quite simple. It's just five, five times five, so it's 25 centimeters squared. The moment of inertia in this case is 1 12th bh cubed, but b and h are both 5, so it's 5 to the 4th power. In this case, the area is 1 by 5, 1 by 5, and 1 by 3, so 5 plus 5 plus 3 is 13 centimeters squared. The moment of inertia in this case, remember, we take this whole area here and then we subtract off these two side pieces. So it's going to be 1 12th bh cubed of the large area. 
so 5 to the fourth power, so exactly what we had over here in the first case. But now we're going to subtract 2 times, because I have this one and this one, b, which is 2 units, h cubed, which is 3. So 3 cubed. And the moment of inertia also has units, and it's centimeters to the fourth power, centimeters to the fourth power. So let's see what these numbers are. So here, 5 to the fourth power is 1 twelfth. 625. Here, if I plug in these numbers, So now we get a good sense of the difference here, right? So in this case, the moment of inertia is reduced by somewhere not quite 20%, but the area, the cross-sectional area, is reduced nearly by half, meaning that this beam in material cost is gonna cost half as much, but it's only gonna be slightly less efficient in terms of how good it is at resisting bending. And I can also experiment with different paper models to see the effect of the moment of inertia. So if I take this piece of paper and I put it on its edge, the moment of inertia of this cross-sectional area, this thin edge, is so small, the paper basically offers no resistance to bending. Now if I take the same area and I give it a little bit of a structure, so I make something like this, like maybe say a simple triangle, now this, this cross-sectional shape, uh, like such, it is actually enough to kind of resist bending. So even though this is in a very strong beam, it's much stronger than when it was just a single sort of floppy piece of paper. So just like when we talked about buckling, the shape of the cross-sectional area, and it's actually the same effect, the moment of inertia, the cross-sectional area, is key to building good structures that can resist bending.